see? Go get him, Carter. Bring us a big fat rabbit. Y'all ready? Never let go. Never let go. So the first reading that I had from the scripts, um, it's not just excitement. Uh, it's, it's about the fact that the dubbed, the dub that came out from the story uh, mm, totally like caught me by surprise. We also, because we are now uh, living a period very uncertain for many reasons, like politically reasons, so the life became pretty difficult through COVID uh, and again politics, if I may repeat myself, and uh, facing now that doubt uh, inside a family between two brothers and a mother and being unable while reading pages by pages to understand who's right and who's wrong uh, puts you in a situation when you're reflecting about your own decision about what is happening every day where every single word from someone else can make your point of view radically change. And that's the point that really makes me extremely excited about the project. So the first conversation that we had about uh, the vision of the movie in a cinematography point of view was the first step was the way we were going to frame this movie. Um, separated in, in two different lines, the, 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 the safety of the house and the dangers outside of it. Um, the way we were going to shoot the point of view of the, the children and the one from Mama. Um, the base was basically giving always a space, uh, an empty space onto the frame to constantly give the impression that something could happen. Danger can, could appear from anywhere. And, and then translate it into a more classical inside, inside the house that will evolve during the storytelling and then bring from the, the way we were framing outside inside the house and increasing the danger and the losing of safeness around the house. The presence of candles uh, into the cinematographic aspect of this movie, it's more like designing your background. Uh, the, um, like the excuse to use warm lights comes more from the fireplace inside the house. And it helps also to keep that vision that Alex and myself had on the very beginning, uh, stepping we talked about how to frame the movie and then how would have been like the, 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 the real photography of the movie it was a uh, Dutch school and, um, and um, like a completely different, like a painter like Caravaggio. Uh, both of them using natural lights to light the subjects. Uh, the Dutch school goes into an extremely soft source from windows, from the exterior, natural lights. Uh, Caravaggio was much more contrasty and much more violent, a perfect example when you're shooting uh, um, horror. And then that transition in between daylights and uh, night lights would be the key. Dutch school by day is swapping into a Caravaggio styles by night and much more contrasty, much more scary. It is relatively complicated to shoot a beautiful forest. A beautiful forest because you see it by eye, it has its own dimension and the perspective. When you're trying to shoot a forest into a camera, it's often 
absolutely flat. So you creating that dimension, helping by lights, uh, so choosing the right time of the day where sun will uh, hit the woods on the side lights, and if um, and uh, and to these also uh, a lot of um, we call it like a smoke effects in order to enhance the shape of lights, and this gives also um, uh, the right perspective to the forest. The approach of Alex uh, for every character is more uh, into a human point of view, more something more um, about introducing the character into then uh, maybe sensibility and the real human character in order for the audience to understand him. Not, not loving him or hating him. It's more like an introduction, but in the most human point of view as possible. Uh, and that enhances the degradation into the storytelling of an horror movie, uh, which is uh, the, the, the pain in our, in our movie, the starvation and, and, and the fatigue. And that incredible doubt about not knowing whom to believe uh, around your mother or your brother or whatever is around yourself. I've had one of my best experiences as a cinematographer so far, and I don't think it's going to happen again soon, which was shooting with one of the most beautiful actress I know, and having her pushing me to shooting her into what she's really going through. I would have done everything to respect that beauty. Prosthetics were so efficient and so well prepped uh, by, uh, by Alex that you didn't, you didn't need it to enhance it. Basically, you have that skin pads on the necks or, or the heavy makeup on the, on, the, on the grandma. The David by itself, they talk by themselves in our shots. And the, the fact that we're shooting such a movie unusual cinematography for an horror movie, you don't need to do uh, a close-up or an insert on, those, uh, on the presence of the devil uh, around these older characters. They are there, and because they are so shocking, they could be there even in a wide lens. You would feel the presence of someone that is not supposed to be there. I think that people will be really excited about this movie for that sensation about doubt. The fact that as soon as the story begins, you will ask yourself who's right, who's wrong, and you're going to go up and down a roller coaster for all the story. And you're going to finish by still asking you who's right, who's wrong, but still now feeling guilty of having believed something that was absolutely right, maybe. For Hallie, getting into character is something that she loves to do. She does an extreme amount of research. She you know, worked very much on the dialect so it would sound authentic. And she really wanted to fully embody who June or Mama is. Um, she really loved the fact that the house was constructed from a pre-existing home and that the doorways and the, the walls and the ceilings were, you know, real and they were small and they were, you know, befitting of a time period in which that house was probably built and that it had just, you know, this gritty feeling of being lived in and being, you know, this warm but like very sad, sullen place. So for her getting into character, she also, um, you know, 
lost weight to appear that she was starving. She did a lot of like really heavy workouts because she needed to be running and chopping wood and using the crossbow. Um, and she just spent a lot of time researching what somebody who lived in a circumstance like this might have experienced and felt so that she could bring as much authenticity to the character as possible. To me, Mama is a woman who is just trying to do the best that she can with limited resources while battling a lot of inner demons. Mama feels very responsible in many ways for this life that is kind of imposed upon her children. I mean, I think Mama struggles with the fact that she is in many ways imprisoning her own kids, but believes truly that it is for their own safety because she recognizes that the evil that has been cast outside of their house that constantly lives in threat of haunting them, touching them, killing them, invading their safe space is always lurking and that she's to blame for that. I think she lives with a lot of guilt that she's had to tell certain lies in order to protect her children. And I think she lives with a great degree of doubt as she vacillates between what is real and what isn't, what has become sort of commonplace and um, expected after 10 plus years of being back in this home when you have no one to talk to and all you can do is try to keep your kids alive every single day with the changing elements and um, what that kind of mental duress might be like for somebody like mama who's just um, struggling for her own sanity while trying to be the best mother that she can. Like many siblings, you often look and say, like, how did these people come from the same set of parents? Um, they're very different. You know, Nolan is um, very curious. He's a little bit wary and skeptical. He's a little bit quieter. He's an artist. He really likes to look at the world from various angles, really take his time observing and wondering, you know, what else there might be. Um, you know, he's somebody who is a little bit more reluctant and is tiring of this life and is not afraid to show how he feels about that. AJ, you know, as an actor, is just a complete surprise because one minute he is just making jokes and making hilarious faces and just, you know, dancing and rolling around and the next minute he's got tears streaming down his face and he's crying over like a horrific situation and you're just you can't believe that like, you've just seen these two things within like a couple minute you know time period um, and I think what's really neat about him is that he leans into the quirks that Samuel has you know he's not afraid to really be you know the slightly odd child he's not afraid to be uh, very committed to like Samuel's diligence and his um, you know, being this this kind of martinet by we do this and we don't do this and this is how, you know, the rule book goes. I love watching him perform that character, you know, to a T and uh, still be able to just like snap out of it and run outside and make everybody laugh. I was just incredibly impressed at what um, Jeremy and Victoria were able to do with our home and with our sets and our locations and to make them feel so alive, so tangible, so palpable. It was just um, created such a visceral response being in that house and watching it come to life at their hands. I think that um, watching uh, Jeremy work with Alex and Maxime, uh, as you mentioned, like even like the wallpaper choices and especially the way that, that they would frame these shots. We have this beautiful shot of Mama leaving the house with the candle, um, you know, at the first light of dawn. And she has the candle at one point in her left hand and the way that the flame bleeds up against the wallpaper and this sort of contrast of the blue light of the exterior coming in and that kind of haunting feeling against this warmth of this woman sort of holding the sanctity of her home right before she crosses the threshold is so captivating. And then she switches her candle to her right hand and walks outside and the world changes from there. But in that precious moment, we feel like this warmth of this home. We feel the peace of this home that she's created. And yet we know she's struggling with so much. So I don't think that would have been possible without, you know, Jeremy and Victoria and Maxime, you know, working seamlessly 
And Maxine paints with light, so you feel that as it touches every frame. You feel that as it touches the sofas, as it, the ambient light, you know, is there just as much as what he, you know, uses in the exterior of the house that's coming in. And it creates a, a really atmospheric, beautiful setting that is like, you know, deeply <laughs> chilling at the same time. You know, we really wanted to maintain as much authenticity as possible for, you know, a circumstance like this. Because we really haven't seen something quite like this and we don't really have a lot of reference for what it might be for someone to live in circumstances like this. So, you know, for us, it was very, very crucial that the boys have a bit of a feral quality to them, that the whole family function a bit like a small tribe, given that they live, you know, in the wilderness, there's no electricity, the boys have never had access to any other people before, they've never seen a phone, they've never seen a TV, they only get to listen to one record every once in a while when there's a new moon. And having that level of restricted access to you know, extrasensory elements meant that, you know, they might speak a little bit differently. They probably would have an economy of words. Uh, they would use like animal sounding calls out in the wild if they ended up, you know, finding a bird or finding a frog or having a moment where they killed a squirrel, something like that, that would show that, you know, they don't need to express themselves and they wouldn't express themselves in the same way with the same colloquialisms, with the same sort of like, you know, phrases that we would use in the modern day world. So getting really involved in the casting process and finding kids that felt like they, you know, would plausibly be of this space was incredibly important to us. And just making sure that as much of the dialogue, as much of the word choice that was used was very simple, was very pared down, because so much could be said and so much could be told just, you know, in the performance of the story. The uh, stripped down nature of the script, the subtlety of what was there, was something that we really wanted to preserve. The writers did a phenomenal job of setting the stage for this and we wanted to bring it down in the most sparse way possible so that people would be guessing the whole time. You know, is mama crazy? Is she actually telling the truth? What does she know? You know, what's happening in real life? And Alex was an incredible partner in working to preserve you know, that precious, precious, you know, little delicate moment that was there between mama and the boys, especially as they only, you know, use their emotion, they only use their frustration, they only share how they really feel when they absolutely have to. So embracing that crescendo of emotion while rooting it in the subtlety uh, was just a very powerful thing for us to be able to do with Alex. Looking deeper into the research behind the movie, we were really impressed by the lore that was, you know, that surrounded it. And I think Alex, you know, incorporated the idea that Mama is reading fairy tales to the boys, that in a way she has to tell them a story and keep them captivated so that they don't question her. So this sort of dark fairy tale is definitely the way that Alex looks at it. You know, he jokes that, you know, she's seeing ghosts. He, I mean, she is in a way, but, you know, he talks about the way that she's sort of entombed in this house and the fact that it's a story she's telling herself and a story that she's also telling the boys at the same time. So it is the little red house in the, in the dark, you know, green woods and it is its own fairy tale. I think people do love to be scared because I think that anything that elicits a deep and palpable emotion, especially that can be shared in like a group experience, is always gonna be something that connects us as human beings. I think the ability to, to feel fear, to resonate with fear, I think that's universal. I think, um, you know, Fear is at the is the undercurrent of everything negative that happens in our lives, whether we intend for it to be or not. So I think it's a very unifying principle. I think um, audiences will enjoy this because 
while you know having that foundation of fear, I think you'll feel incredibly curious about this family. I think you'll really wonder what's going on with Mama. I think you'll find yourself, you know, being mad at Nolan, and then yet also feeling sad for Samuel, and then mad at Mama, and then loving her at the same time. I think we have the ability to to pull at people's heartstrings and to make them feel a myriad of emotions that they're not anticipating coming into what's called a horror film, but really we're telling a much more nuanced complicated drama that just happens to also scare you from time to time. It's a very unique script um, that on paper even might be unique uh, for a studio to make, um, but they believed in it from day one, and um, it just kind of blossomed from there. This got better and better with their involvement, and then as we brought Alex and Hallie on, better with them as well. But I was also very drawn to this story about two brothers that are twins. I'm a father of fraternal twin girls, and they're very different. Um, there's a Samuel and there's a Nolan amidst them, but two brothers that see the world very differently, and they've they've not they don't just share DNA. They've shared the exact same upbringing in the sense of there's Mama in the house in the woods, and they are completely different in what they see and believe. It's fun to bring on a writer-director into the role of really just a director when there's a great script, because I think he recognized immediately what was so great on a storytelling level, the mythology, and yet, you know, as he made these tiny adjustments to come from a place of story and not just visuals, knowing we need to keep, you know, have a little bit more of a scare here or, you know, more momentum in this section of the script or whatever it might be, keeping a thread alive. Um, he was always super respectful and protective of the script that predated him, and yet I th thought he found really smart ways of always being additive to it. We spent so long kind of getting in the same headspace on everything from story to costumes to music to you know mythology and backstory to her character that no one will ever know specifically in terms of what's exposited versus just us as a filmmaking group and you know as any actress worth her salt will do on the day there'll still be you know ideas or thoughts and and you know there the, literally the last scene she filmed was was her as the evil towards the end approaching uh nolan and her and Alex were going back and forth on one specific line, and, and in her last take, I feel like they got exactly what we've been trying to get to. And she's such a pro and has done this so many times, but I think she also saw something really you know, personal and, 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 and again, unique and, and something that she could make wholly her own. And it was just awesome to see someone do that. And, and I, I, bring, I say all this to just say, like, when we started shooting, it was all collaborative, and so much of it had already been worked out beyond the script, just day-to-day -day conversations. And I think that's, that's the benefit of having just an actress and performer and producer, which she is in the movie, who, who really cares and connects to it. Percy did a, um, a callback with both Hallie and um, Alex and Essentially, they cast him in the room, and, and we watched the footage after, and we agreed. Um, and he was sort of a late in the process discovery. And whereas AJ is someone who we had been looking at, and we had kept bringing him back, and he had been in the mix. And um, you know, we read a few kids opposite uh, Percy in the end, and like on the on the day where we had on the D day where we had to pick who was going to be Samuel. It was sort of like, almost as if over this, like, call it, I don't know, five, six week process of him engaging on it, like, he just popped on that day. And it was like, we were all sitting in that room at Lionsgate, and we were like, this is it.
we got the full package with those guys, with Alex and Maxime, and their like 20 year plus year partnership because Alex had in his head, you know, we saw it get sketched out and built. And as they shot each thing on the day, I was just constantly blown away by not just how thoroughly they could cover a scene, but how often within a scene, how many times a day, I was like, man, this is beautifully framed and beautifully lit. And like, will the horror movie audience even appreciate how, how well how well constructed this is, which I think they will. But um, yeah, no, he, their, their approach to it was, was very, um, I think, tonally in line with what was in the script, and I think showcased them and the world around it. You know, these dynamics are pretty universal and are sort of an access point into a very, very unique setting and rule system. Um, and I think in the end, we always talk about, okay, if there was no evil, which we might interpret, if there, if there never was and it was just these three people living there, it needs to, they need to be interesting enough so that I would watch that straight drama movie. And I do think that this movie has that on dis display pretty thoroughly. And then just the ability to at any point that it wants to or the story needs to, it can go into more terrifying places. But so much of it through the point of view of, you know, children, you know, losing their innocence and starting to see the world differently. When you can watch a movie of any genre and deeply connect with a family of characters, that's always a treat. And I think that they're going to get to have that experience and then get brought to a place of just absolute terrifying scares um, and feel like they've gotten to see a great horror movie, but that still has profound messaging and backing and operating in a real sort of classic coming of age way. I received uh, the script of um, Never Let Go. At the time it was called Motherland. Uh, I think it was two years ago, or a year and a half ago. And I remember reading it and kind of feeling a different type of fear than the usual fear I you know, can find in other scripts. Something that was a little deeper, a little more unsettling, a little bit more echoing with a um, deeper um, theme. Uh, parenthood, the relation that you can have with your parents, what are you going to let behind to your kids, the trauma, the generational trauma that goes from you to your uh, children, and a lot of things that were in fact echoing a fear that I felt as a father more than just by reading or watching movies, something that was very kind of unique and strong, but what really got me uh, right away falling in love with the project was that uh, very singular and unique approach of a modern story through uh, the code of the classic fairy tale. It's really about a situation, like a unique situation. It's about this woman who lives in the middle of the forest in a house with her two twin boys, fraternal twins. And it's really about the situation of the world around that's been destroyed and that doesn't exist anymore. Some evil supernatural forces like destroy everything. And they're living inside and as long as they stay inside the house, they safe. If they stay connected to the house with the rope around them, when they go out in the forest, they safe. But there is something, there is something around them. And it's really about those two kids looking at their mom and what she's like teaching them. And one believing everything she says and the other one kind of starting questioning. Questioning, you know, to the point of, is it real? Is that evil force real? Is the world outside still there? And 
that kind of like opposition of the twins and I really like the classical uh, 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 um, theme that you can find into any kind of uh, cautionary tale about, you know, a situation once upon a time, those two boys, their mom, the one that questioned, the one that doesn't question, and how they're going to confront and learn through the process about themselves, but also about how to get free, about how to escape, about how to to get to cut that cord from the house and from their mother and be free. The script was very rich in terms of sound, texture, um, uh, imagery, and, and, and that's like a blessing for a director because of course, you know, it's just building from there to just adding and adding and adding and finding the right crew, finding the right collaborators to just build that world and that universe. But it was also for me a different approach of uh, 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 filmmaking, something very different from everything I've done before. Like when I was doing uh, Crawl or The Hills of Eyes or, or Piranha, they are like very, very different movie and different type of fear. Here it's more like a, a world that I'm building and with a lot of symbol and a lot of symbolism everywhere, a lot of uh, 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 elements that are going to be seen on the first uh, watch or not, but a lot of layer. I mean, it, it's really a movie about layers, layers of story, layers of psychology, layers of uh, relationship, uh, and has a lot of like great, dark, scary fairy tale. I remember thinking about, you know, who could be uh, Mama, who could be that, you know, angular, like stone in the middle of that structure, someone who can carry the movie and, and be, uh, in the same time, the protection of those boys, and in the same time, maybe the danger for those boys. And as I was kind of starting thinking about who, this is where like uh, uh, Ali, uh, 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 contacted us and, 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 and her team read the script and she also had fell in love with the story the same, for the same reason. All of us uh, with 21 Labs were like so involved and, and I remember the first conversation we had and it was really about like making something that was not just uh, another scary movie but something more, just more interesting and more strong and, and maybe something that leaves you with something. You know, like uh, uh, for my favorite scary movies are the one that, that when you leave the room, when you leave the theater, something stay with you. And when she came back, pregnant with the kids, she decided to just put all that darkness away and just be that mother for those kids and protect them. But that darkness didn't disappear, didn't vanish, not something that you can just put under the rug. That darkness stay around the house, was cast away, was like lurking in the woods. That, that supernatural uh, being that's like looking for, her, that supernatural being outside is mama's grudge. It's mama's like uh, 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 um, abuse. It's all the the, 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 the the dark side that she accumulated. A dark side that some, in some situation, protected her and protected her children because she did also some very bad thing to save her own life. Those elements are very important, but that darkness that used to protect her is something that she doesn't want anymore. And I think as a parent, it's something that we all feel, you know, when we, we have like children, we start thinking about, I don't want to expose my, my children to my darkness. I don't want to spoil them. I want them to protect them from that. And I want to keep that darkness away. I want to keep my past. I want to keep everything that's not what I want to use with them, but it's still there. And that's what the movie is about. It's about how that darkness 
is lurking around the house, lurking around them, ready to touch them and to infect them. And, you know, can we ever get rid of the darkness that our parents are leaving for us? And can we ever, you know, cut the rope? As soon as I read the script, there were no other choice. We needed to find a house in the middle of that forest. We needed to see, every time you look by the window, we needed to see the element around. Because everything is tied together. There is no electricity, so all the light comes from outside. So every time I watch, I look through you know, the kitchen window, or the living room window, or the dining room window, I want to see the forest. Because the forest is that scary element. The forest is that place where the evil leaves and wait for them to come out, wait for them to let go, wait for them to, you know, like cut the rope and, and, and question and, and, and be an easy prey to, to, to catch. So, so we had to find like a house. But of course, you know, shooting in the middle of a forest you know, come with a lot of uh, uh, problems. But what you get is so strong and it's so unique because it's a feeling of reality. Like the first day Ali stepped in the house, she felt she was in a real place. She felt like all the, the furniture, all the, the room were real. There was something so uh, 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 um, scary about it somehow. And in fact, the house that we found and the place that we were shooting is a place that has some kind of bad reputation in terms of like, a, uh, you know, like a little shady uh, <laughs> uh, in the middle of the forest place that used to be a real house that has a lot of stories about it. I think that by definition, twin brothers, even fraternal twins, are like the mirror of each other. But I wanted to explore the difference when they come to 10, 11, 12 year old, they start having a different approach of thing and different uh, questioning. They start like saying, okay, I'm, am I supposed to love a person that's like with me all the time? Can I hate my brother? Can I love my brother? Can, 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 can we fight? Can we not fight? Can, how can we survive? And what's the future for us? Because they have a very bleak perspective on the future. What's the future? They have to stay connected to the house with that rope. There is no more food. There is no more resources. So what's tomorrow? And, 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 and starting from, from there, I just saw like two characters that were so, I mean, that was in the script, but we tried to develop that even more to make uh, 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 Samuel, who's more like the second in command, who's the enforcer who wants to get uh, his mother's love no matter what and who follow her to whatever she decides, no matter what is the most awful decision that she could take. And on the other side, you have Nolan, who is more like um, the one that just doesn't want to see the, the shadow projected on the wall and who wants to turn and see the light, who wants to see the truth, who wants to question everything. The same way she was questioning, because when she was a kid, she ran away from that house. So somehow Nolan and her are very, very similar personality. And that creates some kind of jealousy for Samuel, who can see that there is a, a, um, a shorter hand between Mama and Nolan that he doesn't have. And that triangle of uh, a, a relationship and tension and grudges is so fun to explore within that world of the house and the forest. The evil is something very, very suspicious. It tries to get, it mo it's mostly trying to get mama so it can make mama eat the, the kids. And if it gets the kids, I don't really know what it's gonna do to the kids, but the evil just wants the kids because when mama had the kids, the evil got 
kicked out the house. Uh, the rope is connected in the cellar, and the cellar is where they were born and where all the love was created. So the love can't be taken out of the cellar. So when the ropes are in there and they're connected to the rope, it's like the rope has a shield and like it shields them. Uh, what I liked was mostly uh, Samuel's character because he listens to his mom, he loves his mom, he loves his family mostly. And what I liked about the script was all the scenes and how like it happens. When they were arguing with mama and like finally the tear dropped and my whole body went oh, amazing. Cause, like, it, it dropped. I felt all his anger and all his emotion. It was amazing. He was clever and patient. It's like the snake you've seen in the woods. Evil can wear many, many skins. And the greatest trick of all is playing on you boys. And when enough time goes by, you gon' forget it's even me. Gonna let your guard down. And it's gonna get you. One touch. Without a rope on. Is all it takes to possess one of us and get inside the house. Never. Never let go.